morning. Hello, welcome to Omega service. My name is Eunice. Um, if you're new, please come say hi to me or one of the greeters after service today. And if you're new and joining us online, um, please make sure to fill out your contact information in the link in the description box below. Um, also, one of the best ways to connect, get connected to our church is through house churches, where we meet once a week in a smaller group setting where we eat and walk through life together. If you'd like to get more information and how to get plugged into a house church, please come talk to me or Rick Terrell. Let's take a few moments this morning to say hi to our neighbors. All right, this morning we have several announcements for you all. Um, first off, please continue to pray for Pastor DL as he takes his two-week study leave until August 6th, and pray that this would not only better prepare him for the next season of our church, but that it would be also a time of spiritual renewal for him um, personally. And also continue to pray for Pastor Josiah as he continues his uh, Master's in Christian Counseling program at RTS and prepares to get married next month. Second, Harvest 201 signups are located in the cafe. Harvest 201 is a 13-week course um, that helps believers grow in their discipleship. Classes meet every Tuesday night and will begin at the end of August. If you're a member, I highly encourage you to prayerfully consider taking it. Third, if you're interested in serving in our children's ministry, there will be a teacher's training this Saturday from 9 to 4. Meals will be provided, and if you have any questions, please talk to Michelle Lim or Miss Jeannie. Next, in Harvest Min Youth Ministry news, we will be having our annual senior banquet this Saturday here in our Harvest Sanctuary to celebrate and commission off our beloved seniors. We will be having a special night of dinner, worship, games, open mic, and more. Lastly, if you're part of a house church and would like the opportunity to show your appreciation to your house church shepherd, um, we will be having an evening to thank them on Sunday, August 21st, starting at 2 p.m. There will be many opportunities to serve, so if you're interested, please talk to Rick Terrell, and sign-ups will also be located in the cafe. That's it for the announcements. If you could stand for the call to worship. We often have the tendency to get tired of things over time, even things that we were once so excited about. Like when we first started that job that we prayed so hard for, or when we first started serving in a ministry. In the same way, we start to see that reflected in our times of worship. As life gets busier and more and more things fill up our schedule, worship and spending time with God become secondary and travel further down our list of priorities. So instead of center centering our life around God, we start to center it around ourselves and somehow find a way to squeeze God into it. But Pastor John Piper once said, until God becomes dominant in our thinking and in our feeling, until he becomes the blazing sun at the center of this solar system of our daily lives, until he becomes the Mount Everest among the foothills of little concerns with this world, until he rests upon our souls and our churches with 10,000 times more weight than politics and church growth, until then, all our talk about his glory or worship or singing will just be more human engineering of religion of which the world needs no more. You see, over time, we become so good at this human engineering of religion that John Piper mentions, where we create an experience rather than a deep life-changing encounter. But the worship that scripture talks about couldn't be farther from this. Worship was never something that we came up with or created ourselves. It has always been the response of creation to its creator. Countless times throughout scripture, we see the people of God responding to his mighty works and saving grace in their lives through songs of praise and worship. When God saved his people from slavery in Egypt, they responded in Exodus 1511 with, who among the gods is like you? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? 
and we continue to see his praises all throughout the Psalms and all the way to Revelations 4, 8, where it says, day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So when we worship, God is inviting us to join in the never ending praises of his saints and angels that have and will continue to resound throughout time. The one who gave up his very best for us deserves only our best, our first fruits, not our leftovers. So as we gather this morning and as we begin our weeks, let's not settle for shallow convictions or short-lived emotions, but let us come in full surrender and worship this morning. Let's take a few moments to pray and then I'll pray for us. Father, we thank you for who you are, the great I am. You are not bound by time, nor can we do anything to take away from your glory. In all your splendor and majesty, forgive us for giving such little thought and time of day to you. Forgive us for putting you on the back burner and giving you our second best when you are far more than deserving of our constant praise and adoration. Though we feel time and time again, thank you for being so patient and so gentle with us. Would you help us to turn our eyes from ourselves and onto you until you consume our every thought and captivate our whole heart. May your spirit reach into the depths of our heart this morning and tune our hearts towards you. In your son's precious and holy name, amen.
God's love so undeniable I, I can hardly speak the peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call still into love, 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 you're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. Till I lay in my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life, you have been faithful. And all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath.
Father, we thank you for these great reminders that we sing as your church is gathered here in this building, Lord God, things that our hearts and our feelings often forget, Lord God, in the face of difficult times or trials, Lord God, the truth that you are a good, good father, and that in relation to such a good father, we are loved children in Christ, Lord God, and that your heart and your actions toward us are only and always good, only and always loving, only and always faithful, Lord God. So we thank you that as we sing these things, may it just resonate in our hearts that these truths stand above the ebb and flow of our feelings so that we can stand on them and continue to fight to be the church that you're calling us to be, one that glorifies you, one that, exalt, one that equips Christ-centered leaders and to transform the world, Lord God. And so we pray, God, that as a church, you would continue to lead us and shape us to be the church that you want us to be. God, we look back at this past week, and we give you thanks for Vacation Bible School, uh, five days full of fun and, and just laughing and kids running around, receiving the love of Christ. And we pray that in them, the seeds that were sown, the Bible lessons that were given would really cause them to grow up knowing the love of Christ over their lives. That in this world, they would be world shakers and transformers, Lord God, to help others to know the love that they learned at such a young age. God, we thank you for the volunteers and the servants and seeing them at the end of the week, how tired they were and yet so full of joy, having been blessed to give their time, their energy in a way that would grow the kingdom of God. Father, we pray for this Kingdom Keeper Sunday School training that's coming up this Saturday. We pray that you would raise up many who would find it worthwhile and a blessing and a privilege to teach your precious children the, the word of God each and every Sunday. We pray your blessing over that training. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, this, our ministry center project that's, that's in the works, Lord God. We pray for the team of four brothers, for Aaron, for Elder Chris, for Matt, and for Sean, uh, as they are tasked with uh, planning and seeing this uh, office building put up and and, and up and running and, and able to be used. God, we pray always in, in your word you would provide and bless uh, your people with the skills and the wisdom to accomplish the task that you set before them. And so we pray this over these four brothers that when we see this building, until we see this building up and running, God, that you would bless uh, them and then the decisions and the planning that they would make. In the short term, God, we pray for uh, just a connection with a good general contractor, Lord, that you would connect us with someone who would just be there with the skills and knowledge to oversee uh, this project, Lord God. Father, we lift up our pastors to you. We lift up Pastor Josiah in this very full season of life where he started his ordination process, where he's going through the counseling program and where he's, he's preparing to get married, Lord. Uh, we pray that uh, yeah, just on those days where there doesn't seem to be enough time in the day or enough strength in the body, we pray that always you would sustain and provide and bless both him and Jada as they go through this season together, Lord God. Father, we pray for Pastor DL and uh, Olivia and the rest of the Kim family, Lord God. We give you thanks that you brought them back safely from their time of vacation over on the West Coast, Lord God. And we pray that, um, yeah, just as they're back and as Pastor DL is in, his, in the midst of his study leave, we pray that it would be just a sweet season, Lord, where he would really 
hear uh, with conviction and clarity, Lord God, uh, the things that you want for our church in these next six months. And so we pray for this next week of study leave as it wraps up, that you would just really bless it, Lord God, and allow it to be fruitful uh, in his life as well as for the life of our church, Lord. Father, we remember uh, the partners that we're blessed uh, to, to pray for who are on the front lines and who are uh, advancing your kingdom in, in other countries and places where people don't know you, Lord God. People who have uh, just counted the gospel so beautiful and so good that they would leave their homes and go to places like Central, Southeast, and Australasia, in countries like Japan and Thailand and uh, in other areas, Lord God. Uh, we pray that always they would know uh, that you're there with them and that you're guiding and you're leading them and you're helping them to accomplish the mission that you've placed before them. Father, we pray for the brothers and sisters in Cameroon and Spain and throughout various parts of the Middle East, Lord God, and in Ecuador. Lord, we pray that always they would know uh, the grace of your provision and your protection over their lives, that in facing uh, danger, Lord God, they would see the gospel advanced in, in mighty ways, Lord. We pray for our dear Kay, for the Kim family and for Danny. We pray for the transitions in their life, whether it's a new team, whether it's a new season where they send a daughter off to college or just the next chapter in life. We pray always they would know the nearness of your presence as they step into these new uh, areas and territories, Lord God. Father, we also remember uh, as we pray around the world, we remember the church in Ukraine. And we pray again as uh, the war continues on, as darkness is so dark, Lord, we pray that the church there would shine even more brightly, Lord God, that in the face of danger, uh, they would be able to provide supplies, they would be able to help people uh, in the end to know the love of Christ there in that time, Lord God. And Father, we turn our eyes back to our service here. We lift up our sister Hannah to you, and as she comes to testify to the work that you've done, uh, the great things that she's seen in Tanzania on her mission trip, Lord God, we pray that we as a church would celebrate and rejoice with her, and we'd be encouraged through uh, your goodness through her time there in Tanzania, Lord God. And we also pray for uh, this time, the preaching of your word as well. After that, that uh, as Pastor Ralph would share your word, uh, we give you thanks for him, that he would take time away from Crossroads Impact Church to be with us here at Harvest Church, Lord God. We pray that even as their his church is worshiping, maybe 30 minutes before ours, that you would bless them in their worship and that together as churches, we would impact uh, the world in this community and around, Lord God. Father, we pray again just your blessing over him and just the preaching of your word that you would uh, just really allow him to preach a good word, that our hearts would be uh, ready to receive it and eager and excited. And so God, we commit this time of worship to you and ask that in all the things that we do, you would honor yourself. We pray this in Christ's name. All right, church, this morning we had the privilege of hearing from um, Ms. Hannah Chu, who recently came back from a short-term mission trip last month in Tanzania. Um, Hannah is originally from Vietnam, and she is married to her husband, Hai, and together they have two sons, Philip and Nathan. Hannah is part of the Osaka House Church, shepherded by Ms. Char or Ms. Janet and Mr. Charlie Lee. And according to Ms. Janet, she is an angel who loves like Christ does. Please join in giving me a warm welcome to Hannah. Good morning, church. It's a blessing to be here. My name is Hannah Chu. I just want to say thank you so much, my church family, for praying for my mission team when we were on the mission trip in June to Tanzania with a ministry called 1221 Global. Um, it was so amazing to see how God worked in different way in a different part of the world. As a homebody person, I never thought of going on a mission trip so far away from home but God had been so good to me. He fulfilled my dreams of finishing college, and he answered that prayer after 28 years. So I was challenged to do something that I would never have done before, sign up for a mission trip. Why Tanzania? I knew about the mission organization through a close friend who have gone there several times before. And this dress is how we are dressed in Tanzania 
as ladies. Tanzania is an East African country known for its numerous inspiring collection of wildlife. wildlife. The population is about 82 million people. Agriculture composed of 80 of the workforce. Our mission was about to give, to provide medical care, eye care, and evangelism to village people in Mto Wa Mbu. We have two teams, medical and non-medical. So anyone who have some medical background or was willing to be trained could serve in the medical clinic, eye clinic, and the pharmacy that we set up daily to serve patients when why the non-medical team would head out in the village and walk hut to hut to tell the village, the villagers of the gospel. It was very touching to see so many people needing so much of what we would consider very basic medical help, from skin problem to pain that they have so many years, but they couldn't afford medical care. Some people have to walk for a mile to the clinics. It is so humbling to see how they endure adversity and pain with such grace. There are many highlights of my trip. It was amazing to see how God worked the God put the team together from many places and different backgrounds, but we work well together to serve the community, to glorify God. It was also encouraging to see the people hungry for the gospel and to see so many accepting Christ as their savior. Another highlight of my trip was my translator story. He accepted Christ because he had seen changes in his mom's life. Before Christ, his mom was an alcoholic, but after she accepted Christ through a missionary, she quit drinking and would transform slowly into a kind and loving mom whose faith would pass on to her kids, who all accepted Christ and served faithfully in their local church. And there were so many stories similar, inspirational, just like that. I have another amazing Amazing experience when attending village church on Sunday. That day, our team was sent to several local churches. I supposed to go to a church associated with the medical side, but at the last minute, I was led to one of the village church instead. The church in the village had a very simple wood frame with benches. It completely in open air with a roof, but no windows or door and in the middle of nowhere. We rode a van there, but some church goer walked for a mile to get there. The church people really touched my heart. Whatever their circumstances, they were so happy and enthusiastic, and they remembered their songs. Was a song by heart. The pastor wife was a choir leader, a drum player, and to my surprise, she was also a patient that I had seen at the clinic a few days earlier. I would try to share the gospel, but she said that she already a Christian. We were happy and amazed that we meet again. And of course, I asked her permission to share this, and she said yes. Um, then after the service, the church people said that they thank God for the missionary and the mission team who came so far away to tell their people that God loved them and sent Jesus, who is our ultimate savior, friend, our, and our true hope. On the last day, we got to go to a safari with an ama amazing, beautiful view of the landscape and animals. I was in awe of God's creation. Finally, this is a brief recap of our mission trip. 70, 71 people received medical care 358 people received eye care, and for a total of 1,129 people. More than 1,500 people heard the gospel from the medical team and village outreach, and 550 people gave their life to Christ. Praise God. It is so good to serve God whenever we are, and it is also uplifting to be able to serve God through a mission 
I experienced God's amazing work from a different perspective through a different aspect of my ability. He is so faithful and so good. And please continue to pray for future mission trip. Ashante Sana with me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Harvest Church, be encouraged. Let's, uh, you, know, you can talk to Hannah on the side and just ask her more about more stories about her time in Tanzania and just God's goodness there. And so um, with that, yeah, praise God. Pastor Dion's family are back from vacation. You know, he's on his study leave now. He'll, it'll wrap up by next Sunday. But just thanking God for uh, safety as they traveled and just being back here worshiping uh, with us. Uh, in that time, we'll be, we're blessed to have this Sunday as well as next Sunday uh, guest speakers who will share God's word with us. Uh, this morning, we're especially blessed as Pastor Ralph Howe is here to share God's word. Uh, Pastor Ralph was here a little over a year ago, and actually his church uh, actually worshiped with us a little over a year ago, or worshiped uh, in this building after us uh, a little over a year ago. And so uh, for those who don't know, uh, Pastor Ralph Howe is happily married to wife Melinda, father of four uh, beautiful children, two biological, two adopted. And uh, he is a former professional golfer, uh, but one thing that's evident is that he is just a man who loves God's word. And even in his uh, golfing days, uh, giving Bible stu- teaching Bible studies and where God would lead him uh, to leave golf and to, to teach God's word as a chaplain and then later on as, as a pastor. And so currently he is the pastor of Crossroads Impact Church, which meets right down the road here in Windermere High School. They, they started their worship at 10 o'clock, and so their church and family were so gracious to allow him to come here and worship and bless us even as they worship today. And so... Uh, all that to say, uh, for those who want to know more about Jesus and want to keep your ball in the fairway, uh, this morning we're in great hands, okay? So with that, let's give a warm welcome to Pastor Ralph Howe. I, I can tell you about Jesus. I'm not sure how to keep my own ball in the fairway, so I'm not sure I can help you either. Um, I played golf for nine years. I traveled around the world, actually. I played the Korean Open twice, and I ultimately lived in Beijing, China for four years, so I've had a lot of wonderful experiences, and uh, you know, God just teaches you so much when you, when you travel, you step out, you meet people. So anyway, I'm thrilled to be here uh, this morning. So glad to see so many of you. Some of you I remember from uh, just about a year ago. And uh, so grateful for my friendship with DL. Uh, we met just over a year ago. And uh, just, you know, it's really important for pastors, all of us, but, but as pastors to, to, to just, you know, really out loud say the reality that we're all on the same team seeking to reach our community for Jesus. And so to be a part of a friendship with D.L. and some other pastors in town, really important. And uh, your pastor leads well outside of this church as well. So uh, you probably know that, but just wanted to tell you. So uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm going to talk about uh, the Word of God for a few minutes this morning, and, but really just hone in on one uh, aspect of it. And so I'll, I'll start with that by saying this. Uh, I just came back from Israel. Part of our ministry at Crossroads Impact Church is we take groups to Israel. I've been there five times in the last seven years, and it's such an amazing experience to walk where Jesus walked and uh, to experience studying the Bible in the locations where it happened. So uh, have any of you been to Israel? I'm just curious. I'm probably a couple of you. Some of you been? Okay. So some of you know it's just an amazing experience to walk where Jesus walked. And so, but something that's interesting when you go to Israel and you go to hotels, every hotel room you walk into, you will see this. It's called a mezuzah. I know you can't see this too well. I think we've got a picture as well. But you will see a mezuzah, you know, on the door frame of every room that you walk into in every hotel in Israel. You will also see that in pretty much every Jewish home as well. And so the mezuzah, it's actually a little box. And on the back side of it, there's scripture inside of it. And the Jewish people pretty much unanimously put uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and following because it's such an important scripture to the Jewish people. This is the scripture that starts off, it says, you know, hear, is, hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord is one, and then it goes on from there. And so this scripture is so important to the Jewish people that many of them will, the first words they speak in the morning are this, these verses, which is known as the Shema, and the last words they'll speak at night is the Shema, and the last words they hope to speak before they die are these verses out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And so it starts off with this word Shema, S-H-E-M-A. And that word is the word that's translated here. 
uh, you know, hear, O Israel. But the, the word has a deeper connotation than just what we think of when we think of the word here. When we think of the word here, we think of the word listen or comprehend to what's being said. But this word shma, it, it really means to hear and obey. It, it has, it has a, a part to it where it's, it's like you will come into submission under what it is that you're hearing. So it's hear and obey. And what I want to talk about the word of God this morning is this idea of obeying the word of God. And I'll unpack that as we walk through this. But let me read for you what you find in the mezuzah in Israel. By the way, mezuzah is a pretty cool name, right? Like, it sounds really fancy, you know, mezuzah. It's the Hebrew word for doorpost, okay? So it's not that exciting, but now you know why it's called what it's called. Uh, let me read for you the Shema. And this first word is Shema, and it means hear, hear and obey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so the obvious reality of what God is conveying to his people is it's not just a matter of hearing his word, but it's a matter of obeying his word. And so pastors have a saying, at least I've heard it said and I agree with it, uh, it's easier to preach 10 sermons than it is to live one of them. Right? Think about that. Like, I can, teach, I can teach a phenomenal sermon on forgiveness, DL. Bring me back next week. I can teach a great sermon on forgiveness, but when you offend me or you hurt me, it's hard for me to forgive. So that's what I mean by it's easier to preach it than it is to live it, right? But God calls us graciously to live into that, and then he equips us for that. So what I want to do just over the next couple of minutes is I'm going to talk about four words that we find in the Bible. Two of those words are Hebrew words. Two of them are Greek words. And they'll give a little more definition and a little more practicality to how can we actually obey God's word in deeper and deeper levels. Okay? So that's what I'm going to do. The first word is this. It's a Greek word, and it's the word tupos. It looks like typos. It's T-Y-P-O-S. But in the Greek, it's two posts. And it's the word that we get our word type. Like, you're the same type as something else. And it means example. So there are multiple places in the New Testament where we are told that we need to be a good example as someone who is a follower of Jesus. Here's the reality. Your witness, my witness, to a great degree to the people in our lives who do not yet know Jesus will depend on our example. Because once we tell people we're following Jesus, we are now on display. We are now an example of what a follower of Jesus is supposed to be. And people are looking closely at us. There's a quote I like. I don't know who say it, but said it, but it's a good quote. The world will be changed by our example, not by our opinion. We have a lot of opinions out there. But people, when we say, listen, Jesus has changed my life, they may push back and say, hey, I don't, I'm not religious, I don't go to church. But, but your people at work or neighborhood or family members know that you've come to faith in Jesus. They're watching, and you become an example. I become an example, right? And as parents, we kind of know what this looks like. Let me tell you just a quick story to give you the idea. So we have four kids, four wonderful kids. They're very close in age with two adoptions and two biologicals. So now they're ages 16 to 19. So... Uh, you guys didn't really pray long enough for me and my family. I'd appreciate it if, you know, maybe the end of the service we could extend the time, lay hands on me, you know. We have four teenagers, right? But at one time, we had three in diapers and one in nighttime pull-ups, like when they were really little. The typical routine on Saturday, my wife would be cooking dinner in the late afternoon, and I would take the kids outside. We had a big yard. We lived in Montverde, and um, so the kids would be out. And I'm talking diapers. Like my son, picture a little boy, diapers, no shirt, about this tall running around, they're, they're chasing butterflies. I would go out with my golf club and I would chip golf balls around the yard, just kind of keeping an eye on the kids and chipping balls. So that was my normal routine. And so this particular Saturday, my wife calls us all in. I get the kids, I bring them in. And she's made quesadillas, like picture quesadillas, right? Tortillas, one on top of the other. They're round and in between is melted cheese and beans and corn and, you know, really good stuff. 
So she's taken them out of the oven and she's put them on the counter. Now, what I'm about to tell you I wish was not true, but this actually happened in my home, okay? My son, who I had lost track of him, and I went around the house and I came back, he's in the kitchen. And he's knocked the quesadillas onto the ground in the kitchen. He went to the bathroom and got the toilet bowl cleaner. This, this is a new one, by the way. I bought this this morning, so don't, there's no germs or anything. He gets it. Now, he's in his diaper, no shirt. He's about this tall. And he's swinging like he saw me do in the yard. And he's swinging, and he's hitting the quesadillas, and the beans and the cheese, everything is splattering on the ground. It's splattered on the cabinets and the refrigerator. It's a big mess. So he's there, and he's whack, and he's swinging, right? So as he swings and he hits it again, he finishes like this, and I come around the corner, and he looks up at me like, you know, Parents know this, look, the kid's like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now, right? And come on, he should have been in trouble, right? I mean, there should be an 11th commandment, thou shall not hit the quesadillas with the toilet bowl cleaner, right? Every house should have that. So he, but the thing was, it was a really good swing. Like, it was this beautiful swing. So I was like, Jonah, that was a great swing. So I come around behind him, and I'm showing him how to hold it better. So I'm like, here, take your left hand, put a left. So he said, I'm doing it, and as I'm doing this, I wish this wasn't true, this happened. My wife comes around the corner, right? And we're both like, you know, because husbands have that look too. Like, oh, now I know I'm in trouble, right? Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to tell you the rest of the story, what happened next. So I won't tell you that part, but um, I survived. I think we had pizza that night. But so fun little true story from my family. But to emphasize the point, obviously, as a parent, our kids are watching us. And they're going to model their behavior after what they see us do. But listen, as a follower of Jesus in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your home, it's the same thing. People are watching. And so this word to post, you want to know what it means to really live out your faith in Jesus in a vibrant way in a broken and lost world that God is calling to himself. We have to be examples. And so the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians, he writes to the Thessalonian church, and he says this. He says, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example, a tupos, to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. When God calls us through Christ to himself, he gives us his word, but he gives it to us not so we can gain information, but so that as we live into it, we become examples and point others to Jesus. And, and I love your, your church here, guys. You're, there's a wonderful mix of people that are more my age. There's people that are much younger. A lot of young people in here, and I love that. The apostle wrote this to, in 1 Timothy 4 to Timothy, who was a young church leader. And he said this, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Make no mistake about it. You want to live for Christ in this world? We are called to be an example. And for those who are younger in this room, the calling and the equipping is the same. So we get to step into it. So, you know, Shema, hear, O Israel. Hear and obey all that the Lord commands us in his word. Okay, Ralph, so we get it. We're supposed to be an example. That's the first word, two posts. Here's the second word, and it's my favorite Hebrew word that I've learned. And it's the word halak. It's spelled H-A-L-A-K. You pronounce it halak. When you read in the Old Testament about somebody walking, somebody's walking or going somewhere, it's this word halak. It means to walk, it means to go, it means to proceed. But listen, it, it's deeper. It means your manner of living. Halak also has this connotation of it's the way that you live. It's not just the physical act of walking, but it's the way that you live. And there's a phrase in the Old Testament, New Testament too, that I love, and it's this phrase. He walked with God. Or, she walked with God. What an amazing phrase to think that we can walk with God, especially in light of halak. So Christians must pursue walking with God, our manner of life being to go with God as our top priority, right? So a couple of examples. One of the more fascinating people in the Bible to me is a man named Enoch. We meet Enoch right at the beginning in Genesis chapter 5. We only get three verses about this guy in the Old Testament. And yet, he's this amazing figure that it appears he didn't even die. Like, he had such a relationship with God that God just 
kind of translated him to heaven. Three verses about this really important person in his generation in Genesis chapter 5. Let me read those three verses for you. It says this, Enoch walked, halacked, Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Now, this is significant to me because three times, in three verses that we get about this guy, two times it says he halacked with God. And in the New Testament, we learn that Enoch was someone who impacted his generation for God. He walked with God. His manner of being was to proceed and to go with God. And it's something that we can aspire to and be called to. So that's Enoch. He had a relationship with the God of the universe. Ultimately, the information that we read in the Bible, it's so important, but, but the information is supposed to point us to the author, you know, and, and it's so that we can get to know him. So the next major character in Scripture is Noah. Genesis chapter 6, we meet Noah, and God summarizes Noah's entire life in one verse. Now, before I read it, let me, let me put this out there to you. If God were going to summarize your entire life in one Bible verse, what would you want it to say? Because in one Bible verse, in three sentences, God summarizes Noah's life. Here's what he said. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah halacked with God. Noah walked with God. When I think about my life being over and if God were to write one sentence or one verse about Ralph during his days in this world, I could think of nothing better than for God to be able to say Ralph was righteous, a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and he walked with God. I love how God summarizes that. Enoch halacked with God. Noah halacked with God. And then we come to Abram, the next major character. We, read, we, we, we meet him in Genesis chapter 12. And Abram becomes the father of the Jewish people. God has a calling on his life, and God made an amazing promise to Abram and his wife, Sarai. We know them as Abraham and Sarah. Their names were changed. So God tells Abraham and Sarah, you will have a son, and from that son will come a great nation. Woo! They were excited. Nine months, went, nine months went by, no baby. Two years went by, no baby. Three years, five years, seven years. Ten years went by, no baby. And they lost sight of the promise of God. They decided to take things into their own hands. Abraham slept with his wife's uh, uh, maidservant, Hagar. She had a baby. His name was Ishmael. And that was a mistake on the part of Abraham and Sarah. They had grown tired of waiting for God's promise, and they decided to step out and do things in their own way, not to haul act with God, but to do it in their own strength. And it was a big mess. It's a big mess for his family and for future generations. So we read that story in Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16, we read about Abraham and Hagar and the birth of Ishmael. It's a bad season in Abraham's life. It's a season where he's not walking with God. He's not listening to God. He's not obeying God's voice. And at the very end of Genesis 16, the last verse, Genesis 16:16, 16, 16, it says this. Abram was 86 years old. Isn't that amazing? Abram was 86 years old. The very next verse, Genesis 17, 1, says this. When Abram was 99 years old. Now, sometimes we need to see what's not in there because from one verse to the next, he goes from being 86 to being 99. That means 13 years went by where we read nothing about his life. And that intrigues me. What happened in those 13 years where the Holy Spirit felt there was nothing worth writing about his story? I think Abraham was off track. I think Abraham wasn't hearing the voice of God. He wasn't walking with God. He had created this mess in his family. And for 13 years, he was just in this dry spell. But then in Genesis 17, 1, we read this. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said. Now, I know it's behind me. I think it's behind me. But before we get to what God said, could you imagine being Abram? 
I haven't heard the voice of my God that I knew so well for 13 years. And all of a sudden, he hears the voice of the Lord. What's the Lord going to say to me? Here's what God said to him. I am God Almighty. Haul lack before me faithfully and be blameless. Guys, this is the loving, generous call that God gives to each and every one of us. He says, come and do your life with me. Come and walk with me. He says, Abram, you, you've been so far off track for 13 years now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my invitation again that I gave you in Ur to come walk with me. Abram, come and do your life with me. Come and haul lack. Come walk with me and be blameless. It's beautiful. One of the most amazing phrases in the whole Bible, we read it two times. The Bible says this about Abraham. It says, Abraham was a friend of God. Now, I, when I read the Bible, it, it stops me because I read that and I say, wait, you mean that's an option? Wait, you mean I can be a friend of God's? Like, like there are people in this world I would like to meet. Like, I, I can be pretty shallow, okay? There's some movie stars I'd like to meet, okay? There's some singers. There's some golfers I'd love to meet, you know, um, if I could be friends with this golfer or that golfer, that, man, I would be a little happier throughout the day if I, like, had him on speed dial, you know. But who cares about that when the Bible says we can be a friend of God? You can be a friend with the God of the universe. Because of what Jesus has done and because of his grace and his goodness, and listen, because of his purpose and creation, he's created us for a relationship with him. Just like Abraham was a friend of God's, you can be a friend of God. Like, like you can put him on speed dial. And he doesn't have voicemail. He doesn't need it. He'll always pick up when you call. And the way that we most vibrantly step into that friendship with God is when our manner of living is to go with him. When it's to haul lack, it's to walk with him. And the way that we do that is in obedience to God's word. So I love this word halak, and it helps me understand more what it means to obey the word because it's not an illegalistic obey. It's a love relationship that causes us to want to walk with him. If he tells me to forgive, I forgive because I know that's what's best. You know why? Because he said it, right? So we have the word two posts. We're an example. People are looking at you to see if they can see Jesus. We have this concept in the Old Testament of hall lacking, of doing our life with God. Okay, Ralph, how, give me a little bit more. How do we do that? Well, another Hebrew word. I won't spend a lot of time. You guys know this word, um, but it's the word Shabbat. And the word Shabbat is the same word. It's the word for Sabbath that we translate Sabbath. When God calls Israel, you know, he gives them the Ten Commandments. And one of the Ten Commandments is one day a week, you're to do no work, and you are to spend the entire day I would say just recalibrating your heart and life and your relationship with me. Um, and all of us celebrate Sabbath weekly, right? You guys all take a week off and just, I mean, a day off every week, and you pray and read the scriptures and journal. You guys all do that, right? Dio, what kind of church do you have here? <laughs> Kidding. Here's the reality. Um, there's some things going wrong in our culture, and it's affecting all of us. Because we're all too busy. We are all too busy. God says, listen, I've designed you so that one day a week, you're going you're to prioritize time with me. One 24-hour period of, week, of the week, and you're going to recalibrate your heart. Because through the week, you're going to get bounced around and beat up a little bit. It's not easy out there making your way in a fallen world. But every week, I want you to just get back alone with me and recenter yourself on me. And what we do is we get too busy. And I'm not going to say we. I'm going to say me. I get too busy. One, one time I, I said to my wife, I was like, I just wish I had an extra day of the week. And she was like, well, what good would that do? You would just fill that one up too, you know? And she was right. We're all too busy. There's too many options for too many things to do. And you know what happens if we do have any free time? If by chance we pick up our device and we start scrolling. None of you do that, right? Because I do. And I recognize it's a problem. And I'm fighting it in my own life. I have four teenagers. I tell my kids, guys, it's okay to be bored. You can be bored. It's okay to sit on the couch and have nothing to do. But you know what we do when we have nothing to do? The second we have nothing to do, we scoop up that phone and we start scrolling. Or we start playing. Or we start texting. Or I can't believe what they just said. And 
and it goes on for hours. You know what that free time was designed for by God? So that we'd connect with him. Now we're connecting with our device and imaginary people on the other end. And it's a problem in our culture. And it's probably a problem in some of our lives and our families. And we have to fight it because the free time is meant to be time to relax, downtime, and time to connect with God. So on a deeper level, I understand the book of Hebrews talks about the Sabbath day of rest being a day. It's eternity. I get that. But God's designed the Sabbath within the week. So let me read Exodus chapter 20. This is one of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath unto the Lord your God. On it you shall, do, you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I think this is one of the biblical, you know, mandates or callings in our lives that we so easily disregard. Well, the Sabbath isn't for us today. No, it is. God has designed us to need it and to have it. Um, and when you look at the rhythm of the way God created, this is so important. God's, when, when God created back in Genesis, the Bible says he created evening and morning the first day. And then he created evening and morning the second day. God's rhythm of creation was to create evening and then morning. But our day, in our mind, is constructed morning to evening. So what happens? We go out and we work and we run and we're in traffic and, we're and we go and we go and we go. And then we have to collapse and fall asleep because we're exhausted. God's pattern is totally different. First you rest, evening. Then you go into your work day. So when you talk about the work week, God says, I don't want you to have to rest from your work at the end of the week. Many of us are exhausted at the end of the week because we're, we've just worked so hard, there's been so much stress, all the other stuff. At the end of the week, we're exhausted. We need to rest from our work. God knows, no, I want you to work from your rest. It's totally different. I want you to work from your rest, not have to rest because of your work. And so it's a whole different rhythm. And one other thing about Sabbath, because the whole idea of Sabbath is so that we reconnect and recalibrate with the God who created us and loves us, so that we can regain perspective on a weekly basis of what it means to walk with him and to be his example in a broken world. So when you embrace the Sabbath, it, it doesn't just affect that one day of the week. It actually affects every day of the week. This is so brilliant on God's part and so important. So let's just say your Sabbath is on a Sunday. So you take your Sabbath rest on a Sunday. You have time of fellowship. You're in prayer. You're, you're, you're journaling. You're reading the Bible. You're just having a, a wonderful day in God's presence. And then you head out to work on Monday. Man, you're ready to take on the world. Man, I'm ready to go. You know? I mean, I'm filled up. I got my perspective. I got God. I know I'm walking with him. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you're just filled up because you're thinking back to Sunday and you, you've got all that you know, benefit from that time with God. Thursday, you start to wear down a little bit. Friday, man, you're starting to feel a little bit anemic. You're worn down. But you know what you say to yourself? I can make it through today. You know why? Because Sabbath is just a couple days away. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you're looking back to Sabbath and going, no, I'm good. I'm full. I just had my Sabbath. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're good because you're saying, man, Sabbath is coming. So Sabbath doesn't affect just one day. It affects every day. And listen, God has designed us. And he's told us, you need one day a week. Set it aside and spend the day with me. Now, it may be mean being on a device reading scripture. I would allow that. But if it's social media that's frustrating you because somebody's vacation was nicer than yours or you can't believe they posted that or you're playing a game, you know, for hours, reading newspaper articles that just are frustrating you with what's going on, I think there's a sickness in our culture, and, and it's a sickness in our hearts. And I'm going to say it one more time, then I'll move on. I'm fighting it. I'm aware that I pick that thing up when I have nothing to do. And I put it down, and I pick it up. Put, I'm fighting it. And I think you are too. And I want to encourage you to go all the way and win that battle because God's available. The Bible says Abraham was a friend of God. He's your friend. 
He's your creator. He's your redeemer. And he's called you into relationship with himself. And I just picture, you know, we're doing all this stuff or we're just busy doing everything else, blowing off the Sabbath, and we're missing so much of what God intends to give us in this life. So that's, that's the Sabbath. That's the third word, Shabbat. Now, I'm just going to do this one briefly, then we'll go into worship. Uh, this will seem like a funny one to you. I'm talking about relationship with God, walking with God. How do we do that? The next word is a Greek word. It's pereismos. It is not one of my favorite words in the Bible. Pereismos is the word that we see translated as test or trial. And you say, Ralph, why, is, why would you bring that up? Well, I bring it up because it is an integral part of our walk with God that we will face tests and trials and temptation in this life. James writes this in James chapter 1. He says, count it pure joy, or count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials, that's our word, of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, first of all, isn't this interesting? He says, count it joy, all joy or pure joy, when you fall into trials of various kinds. I've never obeyed that scripture in my life. In retrospect, I've caught myself, but when you walk in, it's, see, God's ways are not the ways of this world. Count it pure joy when you fall into trials of various kinds. Why? Because the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. It produces perseverance. And by the time it's done, it says that God's going to make you perfect and complete, and you'll lack nothing. Tests and trials are part of a walk in a relationship with God in a broken world. And God has a purpose in our tests and our trials. And he didn't say, if you fall into trials of various kinds. He said, when you fall into them. You will face trials. Sometimes it's just because we're living life in a broken world. And it happens. Sometimes it's because of our own decisions and we end up in a rough place that God's got to help us get out of. But listen, God is sovereign. So everything we walk through, God has either allowed it to happen or, listen, he has orchestrated it. You're saying, Ralph, well, you're, you're saying God orchestrates times of testing and challenge? Yes. It's clear from Scripture there are times that God does that. But with a purpose to benefit us, ultimately, he wants to grow us to be like Christ. So a walk with God, how lacking with God, having an intimacy with God does not mean that our lives will be trial-free. But what it means, trials take on a different perspective. So again, I'm not going way into this. This is the whole message. But just briefly, let me say this. I think it will impact you. When you go to Israel, it's this wonderful experience to go there, and it's called the promised land, right, in the Old Testament. Remember when Moses comes out of Egypt, he says, hey, I'm going to bring you to the promised land, land flowing with milk and honey. So it's a beautiful land. Here's the reality about the geography of Israel. Seventy percent of the land that God gave to Abraham is desert. Seventy percent of the promised land is desert. Ralph, what does that mean? Well, God is communicating something to us. The desert is a part of his plan for his people. We have this phrase about the nation of Israel. When they went into the wilderness for 40 years, we say they wandered in the wilderness. That's not accurate. They didn't wander into or through the wilderness. God led them there. And God led them through the wilderness for a purpose, in order to make them strong. Okay, because when you go through a wilderness experience walking with God, it doesn't defeat you, it doesn't destroy you, it makes you stronger. When, when you come into the desert, like Israel did, and you realize you have nothing to rely on but God, and then you realize that God's all you need because he's enough, you go to a new place in your relationship with God. Because he's enough, and he's all you need. And sometimes that difficult, dry season in our life while it may discourage us for periods and points along the way, that's why the Bible says don't give up. Because when you come through it and look back, you go, wow, I, I'm so much better off now that I went through that than before. God uses perasmos. He uses trials in our lives to grow us and to shape us. And it's nothing to be afraid of. In the desert, there's, there's constant struggle. But, but then you get to the point where you recognize you can't change the circumstance, but then God comes in, and you see God do a mighty work in your life, and you just can't wait to tell everybody. 
so we want to be two posts. We want to be an example to others of Christ in our life. To do that, we have to have a vibrant walk with God. It's not about knowing the information in the Bible only. It's about getting to know the author. And then as we learn to spend and, and prioritize time with God, by the way, not just one day a week, but find time every day. That's a different message too. But as we vibrantly connect with God through his word, through the Holy Spirit, time with him, you know, then we come into trials and we go, well, what's this all about? No, God's got a purpose in it. And, and some of you might be going, I don't know, Ralph, what do you mean, Ralph? God allows us to go through tests. I thought God loves us. No, he loves us and he protects us, but tests make us stronger. So Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness in order to be tempted, right? John the Baptist lived out his days in the wilderness and he was called by God. The Apostle Paul spent years in the wilderness. There's a purpose in the wilderness and God has our good intended. But all of it ultimately shapes us into the people he calls us to be so that we can be witnesses and point other people to Jesus. That's ultimately what knowing the word is all about. Uh, I love the Bible. Uh, I love Bible study. I love all the information. The Bible's an amazing book. It's history. It's geography. It's poetry. It's wisdom. It's an amazing book filled with information. But God didn't give it to us to inform us. He gave it to us to transform us. And that happens when we engage the word and we step into it. So, I love the Bible, but I love the author of the Bible more. And the Bible is not a means in and of itself. It's a means to introduce us to the one who loves us and created us. It is his word. So, I'm going to pray, and then the team's going to come up and worship. Uh, but wow, Ralph, what did you say? Here, here's, here's what I think I said. We must revere and obey the word of God in order to be the people he's called us to be to point other people to Jesus. Let me pray. Father, we love you. I thank you so much for this morning and our time together in your presence, in fellowship, in worship, uh, in giving, and, and centered around your word. Uh, Father, we revere you as holy. We recognize that you are the one and only God. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth. There is no God beside you. And we've gathered today as friends in this community uh, to, with one voice, proclaim that you are the one true God. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for hope. We thank you for joy and for love. We thank you for Jesus in whom all these things come to pass. So, Father, continue to stir your kingdom within our midst. Father, I do take this moment to pray for those who, who are in a difficult season, a desert season, or they're experiencing a trial. And, God, I don't just pray that you'll bring them through it. I know that you will in your timing, and we trust your timing. Give them your perspective. Show them what it is you're seeking to teach them and how you're desiring to grow them. Uh, so that in, in every part of our lives, in every season of our lives, we can give you glory. And we seek to do that now through song. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all rise as we conclude this worship service with a final song of praise.
wonderful ancient blessing in Israel and it goes like this may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi and what's behind that is when you followed a rabbi in ancient Israel the idea was physically you would walk so close to him in order not to miss anything he might say or do that the dust from his feet would kick up onto you and his dust would get on you so the blessing was may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi and I think it's a beautiful way for us to leave this place today in thinking about our Rabbi Jesus, that we would walk so close to him in his ways that the dust from his feet, listen, that the character of his life would just, people would see it on us. Like, like the dust of our Rabbi is the character and the beauty of Jesus, and people would see it on us. So I want to close with a, with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you go in peace today. If we can pray for you, please feel free to come forward. God bless you guys. Have a great week. church um, that concludes our omega service uh, just a reminder that there are signups for harvest 201 as well as um, shepherd's appreciation day um, if you have your tithes and offerings you can place in the box to your right as we make our way out 
Also, if we could help stack the chairs um, until the point of filling the racks, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you for joining us and have a great week.